Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Denver Regional Council of Governments Board of Directors meeting for Wednesday, March 16th, 2022. Uh, I call this meeting to order. Uh, I am the chair, uh, Kevin Flynn. I am a director from Denver. And uh, Melinda, if you are ready to call roll, uh, I would at first like to acknowledge uh, that we have two new alternate members. I I don't have the participants list up in front of me, so I don't know if they are here. I'll check after I read their name. Austin Ward from the city and county of Broomfield is a new alternate. And Jenny Wilford from the city of North Glen is also an, or, uh, an alternate. Uh, are they here? Uh, I don't see them, but we welcome them uh, uh, regardless. Thank you. Uh, I, we are ready to call the roll. Uh, go ahead, Melinda. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and as the chair mentioned, obviously, if you are unable to mute or you weren't pulled over at the time that your name was called, we will ask at the end for you to raise your virtual hand and we'll we'll say your name out loud. Um, I'd also like to note one more quick change. Instead of doing the role uh, in alphabetical order by name of the member, we're actually going to revert back to how we used to do it before the pandemic, and that was starting with uh, counties in alphabetical order and then jurisdictions after that. So I uh, just wanna give you that heads up and I'll get started. <clears throat> All right, so Steve Odoricio of Adams County. Lynn Baca of Adams County. Here. Jeff Baker of Arapahoe County. Here and thank you, Director Conklin. <laughs> uh, Claire Levy of Boulder County. I'm here. William Lindstedt of City and County of Broomfield. Austin Ward for the City and County of Broomfield. Randy Wheelock of Clear Creek County. George Marlin of Clear Creek County. Nicholas Williams for the City and County of Denver. Here. George Teal of Douglas County. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Thank you. Webb Sill of Gilpin County. Tracy Craft Tharp of Jefferson County. I'm the Jays, I'm here. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. Um, Lisa Smith of Arvada. Bob Pfeiffer of Arvada. Allison Coombs of Aurora. Present. Larry Vidham of Bennett. Here, and uh, may I just add that I have been uh, term limited off of the town board for the second time. So henceforth, uh, Mayor Royce Pendel will represent the town of Bennett. I appreciate that update. Thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, David Spellman of Blackhawk. Nicole Spear of Boulder. Present. Margo Ramson of Bomar. Jan Plowski of Brighton. Adam Cushing of Brighton. Deborah Mulvey of Castle Pines. Present. Jason Gray of Castle Rock. Tim Dietz of Castle Rock. Tammy Maurer of Centennial. Present. Cara Tanucci of Central City. Jeremy Fay of Central City. Randy Wheel of Cherry Hills Village. Happy to be here. Awesome. Roy Palmer of Columbine Valley. Craig Hurst of Commerce City. Here. Jim Torini of Decono. Catherine Whitman of Decono. Steve Conklin of Edgewater. Here, good evening. Good evening. Othaniel Sierra of Inglewood. I'm here. Thank you. Ari Harrison of Erie. Present. Linda Montoya of Federal Heights. Sonia Jensen of Federal Heights. Don Koniak of Firestone. David Whelan of Firestone. Josie Cockrell of Foxfield. Here. Lynette Kelsey of Georgetown. Keith Holmes of Georgetown. Rachel Binkley of Glendale. Ryan Tushare of Glendale. Paul Hazeman of Golden. 
Here. George Lance of Greenwood Village. Dave Kerber of Greenwood Village. Here. Chuck Harmon of Idaho Springs. Stephanie Walton of Lafayette. Hello. Jeslyn Sherezai of Lakewood. Rich Olver of Lakewood. Stephen Barr of Littleton. Here. Kyle, oh, sorry. Did I hear Steven? Yes, that was me. Sorry about that. Uh, Here. Nope, that's okay. <laughs> uh, Jamie Jeffrey of Lockbuoy. David Ott of Lockbuoy. Wynne Shaw of Lone Tree. Here. Joan Peck of Longmont. Present. Ashley Stolzman of Louisville. Here. Nicholas Angelo of Lyons. Holly Rogan of Lyons. Colleen Whitlow of Mead. Present. Paul Sutton of Morrison. Christopher Larson of Nederland. Julie Duran Mullica of North Glen. Here. John Dyack of Parker. Here. Sally Daigle of Sheridan. Neil Shaw of Superior. Tim Howard of Superior. Jessica Sandgren of Thornton. I'm here. Sarah Nirmella of Westminster. Bruce Baker of Westminster. And Bud Starker of Wheat Ridge. All right, at this time, um, I will ask uh, directors to please raise their hand if they weren't able to participate in roll call and we will verbally say your name for the record. And Mr. Chair, would you like me to hand it over to you or would you like me to state the names? I, I can see the names, but why don't you announce them for people who might not be able to see them? Sure. Um, and we have Sally Chafee of CDOT, Rebecca White of CDOT, and uh, <laughs> Bill Van Meter of RTD. And actually, I just realized that unfortunately those names dropped off my list and that is completely my fault. But thank you guys for being here and participating tonight. Um, and... Oh, we do have Austin Ward uh, as well in attendance and we'll bring him over as a panelist. So with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I will hand it back to you and let you know that we do have a quorum this evening. Thank you. That was my next question was, uh, do we have a quorum? And we do. Uh, so we can proceed with business and uh, welcome to Austin Ward. Uh, we did uh, welcome you at the beginning and I think that you are now moved over to our participants. Thank you very much, uh, Melinda. Uh, next item is to move uh, a motion to approve the agenda for this evening. And I would like to ask if any member would like to make that motion. Director Vidim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move for approval of the agenda as presented. Thank you, Director Vidim. And let me uh, uh, say thank you and uh, for your service to the Dr. Cog board and uh, from the town of Bennett. I will miss seeing you and, and listening to you, but thank you very much uh, you. for your participation over the years. Uh, Director. Thank you very much. Certainly. Uh, Director Shaw. I second the motion. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded to approve the agenda for this evening. All in favor, please, uh, we'll do this by voice vote, say aye. 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 Are, there any, are there any opposed? I certainly hope not. And I, can't, I can't imagine that anybody would abstain, but I'll ask any abstentions. Thank you. Um, the uh, agenda is approved. <clears throat> Report of the chair. I have just one item that I want to uh, uh, mention tonight, and that is that uh, in uh, CDOT's Region 1, we have a new uh, uh, regional director, and that is uh, Jessica Micklebust, and I believe that she is in our participants uh, list. <clears throat> Excuse me. I know that I will miss uh, my friend Paul Jacetus, who is, I think, retired from CDOT, a well-earned retirement, and we welcome Jessica to uh, Region 1. Uh, Rebecca White, would you like to introduce her? And I want to offer her maybe a minute or two uh, to, uh, to Jessica to uh, tell us a little bit about herself. Oh, thanks, Chair Flynn. Um, mm -hmm. I, I want to actually uh, give that time to Jessica as well, but you said it um, perfectly that the Region 1 Regional Transportation Director is one of the key folks for CDOT um, for the Dr. Cog region. So I just wanted to put a face with the name and 
And thank you for the time on the agenda tonight and I'll turn it to Jessica. Certainly, welcome Jessica. Thank you so much for the time. It's fantastic to see all of you. I was looking through the names, many of you I've had the opportunity to meet and it's great to see you again. And many of you I have not had the chance to connect with. So I did put my email in the chat. Um, please feel free to reach out to me. And um, so I was thinking about, you know, my first exposure to Dr. Cog, kind of a funny story. Um, I was an intern at URS before they were absorbed by six other companies way back in the late 1990s, um, <clears throat> probably 2000. And the first time I remember coming across Dr. Cog was my assignment was to, I was an intern. My assignment was to go through this large EIS document and check acronyms. And I came across Dr. Cog. So I walked over to my boss and I said, who is Dr. Cog? Not what is Dr. Cog, but who is Dr. Cog? And I have a, a very vivid memory of that because then it opened the dialogue to really kind of explain, well, who is Dr. Cog? And um, you all were not a doctor, although, you know, Dr. Cog kind of is like a doctor. They're, they're the medicine and they prescribe, you know, transportation solutions for the Denver metro area. And um, I, it's been fantastic to work with you in partnership over the years. And I'm really excited to step into this role and really have a, a closer seat at the table with all of you as we try to solve some of the really complex transportation problems in the Denver metro area. Um, so yeah, I'm, I've been in my role for six weeks now. It's a whirlwind, it's a lot of learning. Some of you have already reached out and thank you so much. I appreciate um, you know, getting to know you and getting to know your transportation challenges. Many more of you will get to meet as we open the door to our 4P processes that are coming up in the next few months between now and June, and as we're working on our 10-year pipeline of projects. So absolutely fantastic to see all of you. Thank you for giving me some time to say hello. Please feel free to reach out and um, yeah, let us know how we can help and you know, be of best service. We, we appreciate the partnership with Dr. Cog, absolutely. Thank you very much, Jessica. I'm glad you put your email address in there. We'll make good use of it. Uh, very much appreciated. The next item is report of uh, performance and engagement committee. Uh, Director Shaw. Thank you, Chair. The P performance and engagement committee met on March 2nd following the board work session. The committee appointed a vice chair, Director William Linsett of Broomfield reviewed and approved the draft agenda for the board retreat to be held at the Dr. Cog offices on April 2nd and selected our big winner to be announced at the Dr. Cog Awards ceremony, April 27th. Details are secret until then. Thank you, Chair. This concludes my report. Thank you, Director Shaw. Next up is report of uh, the Finance and Budget Committee, uh, Director Baker. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this evening we met right before um, the director's meeting and uh, we also had an election and uh, Director Deborah Mulvey was elected to serve as the vice chair in the coming year. Um, we had two action items. One was a discussion and we ended up approving an, a resolution authorizing um, Dr. Cog, director to contract with the marketing firm Merit and Grace for approximately $260,000 to implement a campaign promoting COVID-19 vaccinations among older adults through September 30th of 2022. The other um, action item was a resolution authorizing uh, Executive Director Rex to amend the contract with Consumer Direct for Colorado LLC to reflect a revised veteran participation rate and remove the not to exceed limits on the contract through the end of its term in December 2023. And uh, that concludes my report. Thank you, Director Baker. It looks like after the meeting, you're ready to take off to uh, uh, parts far and away, unless that's a virtual background. That's a virtual, yeah. No, I'm, I wish that would Thank be. You. You must be the guy emailing me all those private plane rentals that I'm being offered every day. <laughs> no, uh, director uh, Rex, next item is a report from the, the uh, executive director. Go ahead, Doug. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, I also would like to uh, echo the comments that have been made about Director Vidim and his years of service on the Dr. Cog board. That 
that came as a shock to me tonight, Larry Yang. I'm not going to lie, um, but um, but I want to thank you, sir, for all the years and support that you provided me, and I I appreciate it. And like I mentioned to you via text, if you're in the downtown area, give me a shout. We'll go out and grab lunch. Um, best voice in the business, though. I don't think that's going to change. <laughs> it's great. So thank you, sir, very much. I just I have a couple three uh, items I wanted to bring to your attention. And there are ones that, of course, you've heard before, but I'm going to keep hammering on these until such time that we hold these events. The first is the Dr. Cog board retreat. You should have received a email reminder yesterday from Melinda um, to sign up for the board retreat, which is on April 2nd. Uh, in that attachment, you would have received, um, it, there, there was the, um, the, the, the final agenda was included in that, and we've been working with the Performance and Engagement Committee to finalize that. So. Um, so please, um, please, please, please consider coming to it. I, I, I think it's really, really going to be a, a pretty cool event. We have, we have a facilitator um, on board to, to, uh, to help, um, help keep us in, all headed in the right direction in the conversation. So it's, again, it's April 2nd at, uh, at we're getting, I think, uh, breakfast at eight, eight o'clock down at the Dr. Cog offices. So it'd be great to see everybody, everybody in person for sure. Um, the next event, and, and uh, Director Shaw already mentioned this in, in the PE report, is the, 2000, the 20, 2022 award celebration um, on April 27th. And of course, this is a great opportunity to celebrate all the projects, plans, and people in our region that are, who are helping us meet our Metro Vision objectives. Um, and we, again, would love for you all to join us. Board directors are invited to attend at no charge. You can invite a guest at a discounted rate of $49 as well. Um, Director Vidim, if you're interested in attending that event, my friend, we'd be happy to comp your, uh, your, your registration, just so you know. Um, and so I, I, if, if I may also just make a plea to you all, uh, I would ask uh, that, um, that you think about your just jurisdiction uh, sponsoring the, the event. It's, it's uh, $900 and that includes a table of 10 um, and, and, a, and a delicious meal, at least we all hope. Uh, is a great opportunity to recognize maybe your staff within your communities. You could invite them to, it, to attend and, and sit at your table. But I think ultimately, we're really excited about the event. I think it's going to be a great opportunity. It's great to see all our, our partners, friends, and, and colleagues um, in an in-person environment such as this on April 27th. So please, please consider that as well. Uh, last but not least, um, and this is really the loan programmatic update that I have for you this evening. Um, as you know, the application period for the TIP cycle air quality multimodal regional share call for projects is closing on Friday. Um, next week, Dr. Cog is launching a web-based public comment map seeking input on the project applications. Um, and the whole concept would be to utilize this feedback to inform the discussions and the deliberations of the review panel um, in formulating funding recommendations for the board. Um, and we will be asking our member uh, communities to uh, to help us in promoting this, this public uh, input opportunity. So I just wanted to share that with you. I think it's a pretty cool, pretty cool idea that staff came up with and, um, and hopefully we'll get uh, a lot of public input on those projects. And with that, Mr. Chairman, that's my report. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Doug. Uh, very much appreciated. The next item uh, six is public comment. We allocate up to 45 minutes for public comment and we ask speakers to uh, uh, to give us remarks of up to three minutes. Let me ask if there are folks in attendance who would like to speak. And Melinda, can I ask you to take care of unmuting or moving or whatever you have to do? Because I'll probably mess it up. I see Randall I see Randall Loeb here first. Welcome, Randall. It's good to see you again. All right. Let me just make sure that I can unmute Randall. Okay. Randall, you should be able to unmute. I did. Thank you. Uh, it's always an honor, as I've said, a thousand times uh, to uh, speak to all of you. Uh, I ride the rail a lot and I'm concerned about the safety of passengers with some of our more vulnerable people on the rail who are um, perhaps um, suffering in some way or other. Uh, we need to be aware of making sure that public safety is paramount in whatever we're doing. Um, so I would advise um, the um, Transit Alliance to, to uh, make sure that there are people who are qualified to assist with individuals at stations all along the way and on the trains themselves 
um, who are not able to uh, handle their independence. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. Um, obviously, we are extremely concerned that there is um, a likelihood that the non-congregate shelters will run out of funding at the end of the spring, at the beginning of summer, and what will happen to all of those people, including me. Uh, I keep on mentioning this, not because it's not been a superlative job of even contemplating this endeavor during the protective action stage and then subsequently, but because um, we have a responsibility to take care of all of those people who are suffering in some way or other who are on our streets. And of course, tonight is uh, a, a, a glaring example of what um, portends for many people who without adequate housing and care. Uh, finally, uh, the business of Dr. Cog, I know has nothing to do with this, but it impinges upon all of us in every walk of life that the quality of life of people is at this point extremely difficult not just because of economics and the cost of living, et cetera, but also because of the elements of our way of putting each other down or talking down to each other because of the fact that we have differences. In the current state in Ukraine, we have a responsibility as citizens to stand together shoulder to shoulder to ensure that liberty and the value of our lives is upheld no matter what throughout the world. And with that, I bid you good night and be safe. Thank you, Randall, uh, much appreciated. Uh, next up, I see in order, I see Danny Katz. Great, thank you very much. Um, my name is Danny Katz. I'm the executive director of COPERG, the Colorado Public Interest Research Group, and thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Thank you for your service uh, with Dr. Cog. I'm, I'm here tonight along with a set of partners who you'll hear from in a moment to speak about um, our um, recommendations around rebalancing our transportation system. Uh, a coalition of groups including COPERG, Bicycle Colorado, the Denver Streets Partnership, the Southwest Energy Efficiency Project or SWEEP and NRDC are working on a document that we're excited to send you soon that proposes a set of priorities to rebalance our transportation system so people have more options and we have a greater chance to meet the climate, air quality, safety and accessibility goals that are so key for our quality of life here. Um, we all know we're getting historic new funding and there are new rules like the CDI greenhouse gas uh, rules that give us an incredible opportunity and tools to put our region and state uh, on the right track in terms of rebalancing. Um, our document that we want to send you and just give you a short preview tonight is going to lay out some broad priority recommendations, provide some examples of specific projects we'd like for the region to lift up, and suggest um, some funding sources that are either new or newly available through some of the federal infrastructure um, bills um, in five major areas. One is safety or vision zero. Another is our main streets or people-friendly streets. The third is transit, the fourth is biking, and the fifth is um, uh, uh, smart development. We wanted to give a sneak preview tonight. Um, I'll just speak briefly to the Vision Zero safety and the Main Streets pieces. Um, generally speaking, our recommendations are number one, focus dollars on eliminating injuries and deaths entirely on the high injury network, make that a priority. And number two, upgrade all the main streets in the region to a level that allows everyone to work and live their lives comfortably on those areas. Dr. Cog has done a great job of identifying the high injury network. Now we need to adequately fund corridor wide changes that achieve those vision zero goals. For the main streets program, we have just some great models from the initial round of funding and projects that you all are doing in partnership with CDOT. Now we need to ramp up funding so that all of our main streets get those walking, biking, and quality of life improvements. There are a lot of buckets of available money for safety and the main streets work that we'll be proposing in our document, but just a couple to highlight. The new high, the, um, the highway safety improvement program has new guidance that will require states like Colorado to spend at least 15% 
of its funds on projects that increase safety for vulnerable road users. And there's also a new federal discretionary grant program called the Safe Streets and Roads for All that will distribute $5 billion for safety projects that we should compete for. We look forward to submitting our full recommendations, the examples that we're thinking about and some of the, the, the actual dollars that we think are available. And I think a few of my partners will be speaking after me about the biking transit and uh, smart development. Thank you very much. Certainly, thank you, Danny. Uh, next up, uh, Rachel Halton. Welcome, Rachel. Great, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can, go ahead. Wonderful, thank you. Um, my name is Rachel Halteen, and I am the Sustainable Transportation Director for Bicycle Colorado. Our 2030 vision is a transportation system that's efficient, equitable, and safe for all Coloradans without needing to rely on a car. I've been working with Danny and our other partners on how we can work with Dr. Cog and CDOT to envision, the, to accomplish the 2030 vision. Um, but like you, I'm also an elected official and I'm honored to serve as Wheat Ridge Mayor Pro Tem alongside Mayor Bud Starker. So like you, I serve my city by solving our community's most pressing problems. Some matters are timely and urgent, but most policy decisions are made to ensure we have the best chance of thriving in the future. We don't look back 10 years to inform our policy and budget priorities. Yet many transportation investment we see in our communities perpetually double down on solving yesterday's problems. These investments are disproportionately spent on increasing the capacity and comfort for people to travel quickly by car, while millions of Coloradans depend on safe, reliable options to reach their destination without a car. This is a historic year for transportation funding in Colorado. Dr. Cog will award nearly half a billion dollars to regional transportation projects in the next 16 months. And right now is the time for policymakers to recalibrate how transportation funding is spent so that, so that it solves tomorrow's most pressing issues. It is time to redefine how to measure success by leading with equity, access, safety, and impact, not by vehicle miles traveled, which perpetuates investing in road capacity rather than reducing vehicles on the road. It's time to reset project priorities based on inclusive community input, along with current data and modeling to ensure all stakeholders are heard and that Dr. Cog is able to meet greenhouse gas reduction targets. It's time to realign transportation investments with projects that reduce car dependency, increase access to mobility options and prioritize equity. And it's time to rebalance funding to use existing infrastructure more efficiently rather than adding capacity. There will never be enough dollars or right away to keep up with growth through expansion. And it's time to shift money from lane miles to five sustainable options that Danny Katz mentioned. I thank you for your time tonight and I look forward to working with you to identify specific projects, funding options and achieving the 2030 vision. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rachel. And thank you for uh, correcting my pronunciation of your name. I apologize to everybody whose name I might mispronounce as we go through this next year with me uh, at the head of these meetings. So uh, uh, next up, we have Matt Fromer. Matt, welcome. Thanks. You mm -hmm. did get my name right. Appreciate it. <laughs> Matt, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well done. Um, so good evening, members of the Dr. Cog board. My name is Matt Fromer. I'm a Denver resident, and I work on clean transportation policy with the Southwest Energy Efficiency Project, or SWEEP. I'm here tonight to talk about the importance of smart land use and meeting our goals on climate, air quality, equity, transportation, and affordable housing. As someone smart once said, the best transportation plan is a good land use plan. Locating housing closer to jobs, transit, grocery stores, schools, and other destinations aligns with Dr. Cog's goals to cut pollution and congestion, provide safe and connected multimodal transportation, improve public health and equity, support economic prosperity, and protect our wild lands. When we prevent infill development, we inadvertently promote sprawl. It's like squeezing a balloon. Sprawl damages the environment, locks people into car dependent lifestyles, and is financially unsustainable for state and regional governments. Sprawling development fuels congestion, 
which puts pressure on Dr. Cog and CDOT to expand highway capacity, which then enables more sprawling development and longer commutes and locks us into a feedback loop of inefficient and auto-centric transportation planning. Put another way, we might not need to spend billions of dollars widening highways if we built more walkable and transit-oriented communities. The climate and air quality benefits of smart land use are evident in the modeling. Dr. Cog performed some excellent scenario planning for the Metro Vision 2050 to identify potential pathways to achieve the Metro Vision per performance measures. And the analysis found that we need a combination of smart growth and increased investment in transit, biking, and pedestrian infrastructure. To compare two potential planning scenarios, the transit funding scenario would invest an additional $16 billion in transit over the next 30 years resulting in a 2% decrease in VMT or vehicle miles traveled per capita. A second scenario combines the same $16 billion for transit with a smart land use scenario that focuses new development on urban centers and near transit. And the re result is a 25% reduction in VMT per capita or 12 times greater than the transit investment on its own. Smart land use is a force multiplier for greenhouse gas and VMT reduction. This smart growth scenario is basically the inverse of the current trend we have, where about 75% of lots under development in the Denver metro area are new single family subdivisions on undeveloped land with little access to transit or jobs and services within walking distance. We continue to dedicate too much land to cars, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, minimum parking requirements, which are forcing new developments to overbuild on parking and dedicating far too much space to cars instead of housing and other spaces for people. A 2019 study from RTD shows that during peak periods, about 15% of residential parking lots near high frequency transit stations are sitting empty. That's during peak periods before the pandemic. This is empty asphalt where, where we should be investing in good placemaking with affordable housing, businesses, and restaurants. To better integrate transportation and land use planning, we should consider the land use implications of all proposed projects in the TIP and RTP and reward projects that incorporate smart land use strategies. I know land use is a bit of a third rail in Colorado, but infill yeah. development is one of the yeah. best tools we yeah. have to cut pollution and congestion okay. and create more livable and healthy communities for residents of Denver. To okay. quote one of my favorite transportation planners, if you're just focusing on transportation infrastructure, you're looking at the tail, not the dog. Now is the time to elevate the issue before we add another 1 million people to our region over the next 30 years. Thank you. Thank you, man. Uh, next up is Pete Van Hooven. Uh, welcome, Pete, to the meeting. Go ahead as soon as you're ready. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Wonderful. Thank um, you. Go good ahead. evening, board members. Uh, thank you for hearing my comment tonight. I'm Pete Van Heuven, Director of Government Relations for Bicycle Colorado, where we represent the interests of 2.3 million Coloradans who ride a bike every year, many of them on the front range. We know 2022 will be one of the most important years in decades to shift funding away from past priorities and toward immediate solutions that focus on reducing vehicle trips. And we believe projects that increase non-polluting uh, trips should be at the top of that list. Uh, and that means I'm talking about bicycle trips. So today we're asking you to prioritize projects at Dr. Cog's envisioned regional active transportation network to connect Dr. Cog's communities with safe bicycle corridors. The good news is there's lots of funding. There are multiple funding sources available for bike ped projects from both multimodal project funding sources and also all of the flexible dollars <clears throat> that can be used for multimodal projects. As icing on the cake, Danny mentioned, Colorado's Highway Safety Improvement Program funds must use 15% of funds for multimodal projects here in Colorado, and the new Safe Streets and Roads for All grant program is an excellent option, too. There's really never been a better year to get real about building out Dr. Cog's regional bike ped network. So as examples here, just some of the larger scale multi-use trails that you can prioritize to create those missing connections between communities that don't have useful non-polluting options yet. In the north, you could establish new high quality north-south connection routes like Golden to Boulder on 93 or completing uh, State Highway 119, that's the Boulder to Longmont Bikeway. 
And in the south, you can connect the northern Douglas County, Castle Rock, Castle Pines areas and build the missing segments of the Colorado Front Range Trail by completing the Hess and Daniels Park Trails to connect Lone Tree, Castle Pines, and Castle Rock, and the Plum Creek Trail between Chatfield State Park and Castle Rock. You can also build the new trails already identified in the Dr. Cog 2050 MetroVision Transportation Plan. I saw three I liked a lot. Smith Road in Adams County, the RTD Rail Trail from Boulder to Erie, and the McCaslin Regional Trail in Boulder. And finally, in the east, uh, as a new idea, you could create a safe 24-hour bike route to Denver International Airport and points east. Uh, this would reduce trips uh, in a way that could have a big payoff because DIA is the largest employer in the state with 35,000 workers. A bikeway to DIA and beyond would serve many more as the east, sorry, the area to the east of Metro Denver is rapidly developing. So just to close, um, bike projects are just too often envisioned and ultimately funded as smaller segmented pieces or as mitigation measures that are tied to a project for another purpose. But now's the time to think big on biking and it's time to build those longer connecting bikeways like the successful US 36 bikeway and connect Dr. Cog's regional communities via a truly regional bike network. And now I'm gonna steal my last 10 seconds and also congratulate Jessica. Um, and uh, Jessica, we're looking forward to working with you in region one. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pete. Uh, next up, uh, Molly McKinley. Good evening, y'all. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, good evening, Dr. Rob board members, and thank you so much for holding this space for public comment. My name is Molly McKinley, and I'm the policy director for the Denver Streets Partnership. Um, we believe in an equitable and vibrant Denver that guarantees our public spaces are designed for people, and we believe that human dignity should be the guiding principle for the design of our transportation system. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here with all of my other colleagues tonight um, in this moment that is really pivotal for our transportation system. Expanded public transit is essential to meeting the needs and the goals of our region and must be centered in upcoming investments. The Denver region needs a complete transit system that offers everyone fast, frequent, reliable, affordable service that takes them where they wanna go. While the Denver region has invested heavily in rail over the last couple of decades, a lack of investment in bus service and associated infrastructure means that our transit system is limited and has low ridership. I'm asking you to prioritize two things, just two things, um, a regional network of bus rapid transit and expanded transit service operations, both of which have the potential to be the most convenient, reliable, and fast way to get around the region. Our arterials like Federal, Colfax, and Colorado present tremendous challenges today, but also tremendous opportunity for the future of how we move people in the region if we invest in bus rapid transit. And um, I can speak to Denver specifically, there's a tremendous potential for increased transit service. A 2017 report in Denver showed that more than 70% of Denver residents live within convenient walking access to transit, but only 36% have convenient access to all day frequent service. So think about transit service that runs at least every 15 minutes. I'm particularly excited about the regional bus rapid transit routes that have been identified by Dr. Cog and RTD. It would cost $1.3 billion to build out 10 of these routes, which are key connections throughout our region. Thanks to the flexibility of new federal funding, these projects could be funded through federal formula funding and grants that you would expect like the Carbon Reduction Program, but also through programs like the National Highway Performance Program. We can fund transit with a highway program, um, and we absolutely should be. Beyond those new programs, funding could also be redirected from projects that were identified for funding with values of yesterday, like the proposed widening of I-25 in Denver, to fund these regional bus rapid transit routes that really meet the needs and values of today and our future, like moving people, not just personal vehicles. I thank you for hearing public comment this evening. And I look forward to continuing this conversation with all of you so that we can build a transportation system that really expands equity and access while reducing our impacts on climate change and air quality. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Uh, are there other uh, folks in attendees who want to address the uh, board? I don't see any. And so let's move on to the next item on the agenda. Thank you to all of our speakers. 
for being here tonight. Uh, item seven is a uh, soliciting a motion to approve our consent agenda tonight, which consists of the minutes from last month's board meeting. Do I have a, a member who, a director who would move to do that? Uh, director Baker. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I would make that motion to approve the uh, consent agenda. Thank you very much, Director Teal. Second. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, Director Levy, were you going to second, or did you have a comment on the minutes? I um, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Chair. I actually had a comment on the minutes, just yes. briefly. Yeah, there um, there is just a notation in the minutes that um, uh, on the nominating committee um, recommendation for Front Range Passenger Rail District, and it indicates in the minutes, and it's accurate that. Uh, that I had not decided uh, whether I would be applying for that position. I did want to just let the board know that I will, that I have applied. And um, the nominating committee uh, had uh, recommended a letter of support from Dr. Cog. I just wanted to say that I would be very grateful for that support. Um, so it's not a correction or addition to the minutes, but it was just the best time for me to say that. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Appreciated, uh, Director Rex. Can you uh, reach out to Director Levy and discuss that? Yes, I will. I'm texting right. right now as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. All these different technologies going back and forth. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Director Levy. Uh, we have a motion on the floor to approve the consent agenda. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say no. Thank you. Uh, any abstentions? No. Thank you. Uh, let's move to our next uh, item, which is action item. Uh, the first action item is item eight on the agenda, discussion on the TIP waiting list funding recommendations. It's attachment B in your packet. Uh, Todd Cottrell, I uh, believe you'll put it up on the screen as well, correct? Uh, yes, I believe Josh is gonna put that up for you. Well, thank <clears throat> you, Josh. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so last year, uh, Dr. Cog became aware of additional FY22 funding sources, um, including the State Multimodal Transportation and Mitigation Options Fund, or MMOF, and additional federal funding um, through the signing of the new federal transportation bill. Um, the total of this funding um, was estimated at $87.6 million. So uh, contained within attachment one, uh, this is broken down by funding type, um, and by wait list, so both the regional list and all of um, each of the eight sub-regional wait lists. And because a great majority of this funding was available as this multimodal um, options fund, um, that has that unique eligibility and the FY22 funding happens to be federalized and has those obligation and end dates, um, staff broke this down even further and provided individual targets by funding type to a, each wait list. Um, so this is important to point out because this is quite different than what we have normally done in the past, um, but we felt it was necessary just to be fair and equitable across all the waitlists um, that had projects. So staff began the waitlist process by dividing the available funding, 20% uh, to the regional share, and then 80% to the sub-regional share waitlist. Then of course, working with the individual sponsors on each waitlist in the rank order, um, as indicated in attachment two, either until the funding target for each waitlist was exhausted or the last project was reached. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, this was a, a little bit of a different waitlist process and did have some unique um, characteristics that I think we'd like to point out. So any FY22 funding that was not programmed during this process would simply roll over um, into the ongoing calls for projects that are contained right now. Um, especially if, if sponsors were not content with the scope of their project on their wait list, or if they had, um, if their funding breakdown or funding has changed within the application. Um, one option to them was always that they could not accept the wait list funding and then simply apply during one of these calls for projects that are gonna take place. Um, sponsors were also told that, that this would be the last wait list process for these existing wait lists. Um, and again, that's according to the adapted, po adapted policy. Um, as outcomes of calls three and four later this year, which will include the development of the 24 to 27 tip, we will be creating new wait lists, um, again, with that tip. Um, and then of course, sponsors would need to 
you know, fit the funding of their waitlist project within the funding parameters that were set um, for the funding that we had available. Um, and even if they were to accept funding and they, you know, might possibly have to adjust their match rates um, just to make that fit. So again, there was some unique circumstances with this. Um, and I think that is reflected in the, the total um, amount of sponsors that have accepted this funding or, or are recommended to be accept, accepted this funding. Um, so based on all, those, all of those discussions that we had with the project sponsors, um, attachment three includes the recommended list of projects to fund. Uh, this includes nine projects, totaling $18.3 .3 million. Uh, we've also included within attachment three, uh, a breakdown of the funding type that would be used, um, the total match, the total cost, um, the funding years, and of course, some higher level scope elements that would be included with that project. Um, so that concludes the information I have on this item. Yeah, I'd be happy to take any comments or questions. Um, both the TAC and RTC have approved and recommended. Um, so if not, the motion is on your screen for you right there, um, but it's to a um, uh, approved programming unanticipated available FY22 funding to waitlist projects and administratively modify the TIP. Thank you, Todd. Much appreciated. Uh, questions from directors. Uh, Director Levy. Oh, okay. Um, a what we call a stale hand in uh, Zoom. Uh, questions from directors or comments. Uh, Director Peck, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank the directors to um, hopefully approving this trip, this TIP funding because of our Highway 119 and uh, Highway 63, North 63rd Street uh, for the regional FY22 to 25 TIP call. This uh, funding for this intersection for this region is very, very important to Longmont and to the uh, whole region for our multimodal access route on Highway 119. So I am asking for your support and to, uh, to pass this um, TIP funding for the wait list. Thank you. Thank you, Director Peck. We've had several uh, very good discussions on this at prior meetings, including at RTC yesterday and, and prior to that. So uh, any other directors with comments or questions? I see none. Uh, with that, then I would like to ask uh, any director who might like to make the motion, uh, Director Teal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would be remiss though if I did not first, uh, before making motion, remind Commissioner Levy that uh, were she to do that at CCI, she would owe a donut. However, moving along, move to approve programming. <laughs> Unanticipated available FY 2022 funding to waitlist projects and administratively modify the FY 2022 to 2025 tip. Uh, thank you, Director Teal. The next hand I have in my in order here, and I'm assuming it's all in order, is uh, Director Starker. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I'd like to second the motion. Thank you very much uh, for that. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? on this. Uh, it was a very uh, interesting discussion that we had all along the way. It's been pretty well briefed. I see no further hands up, so let me call for the vote then. All in favor of the motion to approve programming the unanticipated uh, fiscal year 22 funding list to waitlist projects, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Anyone who is opposed, please say no. I hear none opposed. Are there any abstentions? I hear no abstentions. Excellent. The uh, motion is approved. Thank you very much, uh, Todd and Josh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Certainly. Uh, next item is nine, discussion of the transit super call project funding recommendations. That's attachment C in your packet if you're following on a, another screen. But uh, I think Matt Helfant will have that up for us on the Zoom screen as well. Uh, Matt, are you uh, ready to go? Ready to go, Mr. Chair. Uh, good Excellent. evening, everyone. Oh, did you say something? No, I said excellent. Thank you. But can oh, you okay. match? Oh, <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Can you Matt please, uh, can you please maximize? Uh, Matt, can you maximize the screen? However, uh, excellent. There you go. There you go. 
Good evening, everybody. Um, so uh, we, uh, Dr. Cog had its first ever uh, combined call for projects or super call, we borrowed that one from CDOT, um, that includes the uh, human service transportation set aside through the TIP, the uh, FTA 5310 program uh, in the Denver Aurora urbanized area and Older Americans Act funding through the Area Agency on Aging. These projects would be implemented uh, between July 1st, 2022 and June 30th, 2023. So um, we received 14 proposals, uh, from, uh, 14 proposals from 14 uh, organizations requesting significantly more than what was available. Um, and this, uh, the, the HST and uh, 5310 project, uh, projects get approved by uh, TAC and RTC only. And, and the board, of course. Um, but it's a separate process from uh, the uh, Area Agency on Aging. Uh, the, uh, there's more information in the packet, but here's the list of projects that were recommended by the independent review panel, including uh, carryover funding. And the motion is uh, on your screen, and I'd be happy to take any questions you have. Also want to say that uh, Travis Noon, who administers these grants, is also on the line. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, on the assumption that folks have had a chance to go through the uh, packet uh, and uh, understand all the uh, awards that are being made, the recommendations, uh, let's entertain any further questions. Uh, Director Hazeman. So I, I see that Golden had made a submission, and of the all the submissions, it uh, doesn't seem to have gotten anything. And I was just wondering if there was twelve dollars or some amount that might be uh, available. So um, Travis is on the line. Uh, Travis Noon's on the line, and he can answer the, uh, that question. Absolutely. Thank you, Matthew. Um, so the reason the city of Golden's proposal was not funded, uh, the, the, they proposed purchasing a vehicle and then also starting a fixed route service. Uh, the fixed route operating funding that was included there wasn't scheduled to be starting until uh, 2024, uh, which was outside the scope of these proposals. Uh, and then the committee that reviewed all of this sort of felt it was a bit of a risk to, to fund a vehicle if there wasn't secured operating funding at that time. Uh, we did, uh, and we will recommend to the staff that um, submitted this proposal at the recommendation of this committee to recommend that uh, the city look at possibly um, contracting out those types of services and, and applying again in the future. Thank you. Yep. That it, Director? Thank you. Any other questions from uh, directors? Any comments? I see none. In that case, uh, let me solicit uh, a, a motion as to what to do with uh, with this item. The motion is in the packet. Would anyone like to make it? Uh, Director Levy, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I uh, move to approve the HST and FTA 5310 projects for July 2022 through June 2023 as recommended by peer review panel including staff recommended carryover projects. And I, I will just note that the funding uh, requested by Boulder County will fund um, free service within the city of, or the, the, yeah, the city of La, uh, Lafayette. So we're very appreciative of that funding. Thank you, Director Levy. Uh, Director Maurer. I just want a second. Thank you very Bye. much. Uh, any other comments? Uh, Director Peck, do you have a comment or uh, was your hand up to second? Thank it you. It was up to second. I apologize. Oh, no problem. Thank you very much. Hard to figure Thank out. On. We're still getting used to, after two years, still getting used to this system. Hopefully not much longer. Uh, motion has been made and seconded with no further comments. Uh, let me call for the vote. All those in favor of this motion, please say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. Are there any abstentions? Say abstain. Hearing none, the motion is passed unanimously. Uh, thank you very much, Matt. Uh, much appreciated.
Uh, the next item on our agenda, uh, we're going to go to Rich Morrow for a discussion on our state legislative issues. Uh, we have two sections to this A and B, bills on which we've previously taken positions. And then I believe we have two uh, uh, new items uh, to consider. Rich, are you here? Yes, I am. Excellent, I see you now. Thank you, Mr. Hey. Chair. Take it away. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to start, if I might, uh, with just a couple of introductory comments before we get into the bills. Uh, one is that um, we're, I think, exactly or almost exactly halfway through the legislative session as of now. And to me, that just means that things are going to really start getting interesting. Uh, we're, we're seeing the, the uh, light at the end of the tunnel, I think, but there's still a lot of work to go on, including uh, starting tomorrow with uh, the uh, March revenue forecast that will, I guess, in a way, kick off the budget season. The uh, JBC has been working for a long time on the budget. As some of our members, like Claire Levy or Director Levy knows, um, and um, they'll be working to close that out uh, and introduce it in the coming days. And uh, I would say if you have any specific questions uh, as we go on about the budget, um, our lobbyists, Ed Bowditch and Jennifer Castle are here and they're much, much better than me at answering some of those questions. Um, and also there are a whole lot of uh, bills that I, I hear are, um, uh, being being worked on and um, will be introduced in the coming weeks, some of which I will be of a strong interest to Dr. Cog and to the board, um, including uh, bills implementing recommendations from those transformational task forces that met last summer, um, the affordable housing one and the behavioral health one. Um, we've seen a couple bills come out on those already, but uh, a few of the uh, really big bills um, are coming out here soon. And so we'll be working on those and bringing to you, uh, bringing those to you at, at your next meeting. I also wanted to quickly take the uh, opportunity to, or the, to mention to you that there's one bill that was just introduced on Monday that I would have otherwise had on this list, but typically uh, it's been your policy to, um, not take up bills that you haven't had at least 48 hours to discuss, uh, but it's an important bill uh, dealing with safety and assisted living residences. So I did wanna put you on notice that it, it is out there and uh, myself and the other Dr. Cog staff have been working uh, at the sponsor's request in recent weeks to help draft that bill. So it will be a major bill that, that we're gonna be working on. Um, and I, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it was been introduced to Senate bill 154. Uh, so with that, I wanted to give some quick updates on the bills, uh, that you've taken positions on in the last couple of months. And, um, uh, I'll just do quick updates and then you can ask questions or make comments on any of those if you want, before we move on to the two brand new bills. So first... Uh, Senate Bill uh, 1035, the modernization of the older Coloradans Act, has actually moved through the legislature, passed both houses, and is uh, going on to the governor. And we will expect to see that signed real soon. So we're very happy uh, about that uh, bill having uh, moved successfully through the legislature. Um, the next bill on the status list, Senate Bill 79 that deals with uh, uh, dementia training in uh, long-term care facilities um, uh, should pass. Uh, it has gone through the Senate. I'm yeah, it's gone through the Senate. Uh, was heard in committee yesterday in the House. It's being pulled off to have some uh, last-minute amendments considered. But once those are are dealt with, that that bill should move through the House. A um, couple of the bills that uh, this board is. Uh, if you recall, has taken a lot of interest in and um, had good conversations about at previous meetings. Um, Senate Bill 1026 on the alternative transit options um, has uh, passed out of committee and is sitting in appropriations 
uh, because of the fiscal note. And so we should probably see some movement on that in the coming weeks. Um, House Bill 1028 on the, uh, the bicycle rolling stops. Um, that bill has uh, um, is, has moved as well. I think you know that uh, Director Stolzman has testified both in the House and I think it was yesterday uh, or Monday in the Senate. I think it was yesterday in the Senate. Um, and uh, that bill uh, was amended to, to Dr. Cog's satisfaction in, in the House and I, I expect should move through the Senate uh, without any additional issues. Um, the other one that we had a big conversation about last month, um, House Bill 1138 on the uh, um, employer commuter uh, programs. And uh, the, that bill, unfortunately, in, in some ways was uh, postponed indefinitely in committee after a flurry of uh, action and work on amendments uh, leading up to the, the actual hearing. And uh, uh, we were able to get uh, Dr. Cog board's recommendations added to the sponsor's amendments, particularly the ones for adding Dr. Cog in the development of the commuter survey and um, uh, being paid for the work that we would be doing uh, with employers to the tune of $500,000 uh, a year. Um, but after all of that work, the bill uh, ended up being uh, postponed indefinitely in committee anyway. So we'll see, um, you know, uh, House Bill 1026 is somewhat related to that bill. So we'll see how all that plays out as the session move on, moves on. Uh, I was reminded also earlier today by Steve that um, the, you know, members, directors had expressed some interest in knowing more about different kinds of uh, uh, employer programs and uh, tax incentive programs and so forth. And we do, I believe, have available um, a good uh, guide of uh, programs uh, in uh, practice throughout the country that um, we could provide to you all if you're interested. Um, and uh, so I just wanted to mention that because that was a topic of discussion um, last month. With that, I believe those are the only comments I have on the uh, bills from previous board meetings. And I'll just see if there's any comments or questions on yeah. any of that or the budget. Thank you, thank, uh, thank you Rich. Do any directors have comments, questions uh, of Rich on these bills? If not, I, I have just one quick one. Uh, Rich, you mentioned on Senate 79, the dementia training, uh, which we took a position, I believe, of support uh, that uh, there had been some last minute amendments. I'm just curious if you know, uh, were they minor amendments? Uh, hopefully they weren't substantive and that would in any way affect whether we would support them or not. Yeah, that's correct. They're just minor amendments. Okay. Um, I believe actually from uh, Healthcare Policy and Financing Department, just uh, tweaking some language to clarify uh, some directions to them. Great, that's good to know. Uh, any other questions on the bills on with that we've already had discussion at the board level in previous meetings? I see none. Uh, go ahead, Rich. Let's move on to uh, B, uh, the two new bills. Um, Senate Bill 144. Um, this 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 is a bill that actually well we recommend uh, in the packet to, to monitor, but I'm going to want to. Uh, amend that or change that to a staff recommendation to support. Oh, um, when this uh, when this bill first was introduced, uh, we weren't exactly sure what it was about and how it might affect uh, our uh, it, primarily our area agency on aging. And um, after conversations with the sponsor and some of the proponents and then listening, it was actually moved quickly. It was heard in committee last Thursday and did pass out of committee um, and was heard on the uh, second reading on the floor of the Senate today and, and passed. So it's actually moving pretty well. But basically what this bill does is clarify that the uh, TNCs, the transportation network companies can contract with local governments 
and nonprofits uh, for what they refer to as public benefit services. There's there's been some there was there was some confusion in the way the original TNC bill was written, an amendment that had been put on that bill that had caused um, particularly a company called Hop Skip Drive uh, uh, about their ability to contract with school districts to provide rides to children. Um, and as, as it turns out, you, some of you may re recall that Dr. Cog actually has uh, a contract and I think for a few years at least with Hop Skip Drive to uh, provide transportation uh, for our older adults. And uh, we've also contracted recently with Uber. So we were trying to figure out if any of this, anything in this bill would affect our contracts with those. And in fact, I think uh, passing this bill and clarifying that language um, would actually solidify the, the existing practice that we have so that there wouldn't, uh, these contracts would not be called into question. So with that long explanation, uh, I'd like to recommend that uh, uh, board support this bill. Thank you, Rich. Uh, let's have some discussion on this. Any directors have uh, questions or comments from Rich or maybe for Ed or Jennifer as well who are in the meeting? I don't see any hands. Rich, I don't know what that means. <laughs> well, I think you must have done a great job. Um, I think that's what it means. There you go. Uh, well, with could, no questions, uh, I guess we uh, could put it to a vote then. Yeah. If uh, someone would like to make a motion. This is intriguing. <laughs> would any director, <laughs> thank you for rescuing me, Director Levy. <laughs> go ahead. Always happy to oblige as long as I don't have, owe anybody a donut at the end of it. Um, I move that the Dr. Cog board take a position of support on Senate Bill 144. Thank you, Director. Uh, Director Peck. I second that motion. Thank you very much. Uh, a discussion on this. Would any director like to hear more about it? Ask a question? If not, we will put it to a vote. And when I do that, I wanna remind folks that uh, for Dr. Cog to take a position on pending legislation, our policy is to have a two thirds uh, approval by the members who are present and voting. So that requires that I first ask if there are going to be abstentions because those directors abstaining are not counted as the, in the uh, denominator. So if you are going to abstain on the question of supporting this uh, Senate Bill 144, the staff recommendation, please raise your virtual hand uh, so that Melinda can take account and uh, deduct and do the math that I am incapable of doing on the fly. <laughs> All those who abstain, please raise your hand. If Mark, Mr. Archie, Melinda, I see eight hands raised. I see nine hands raised as abstaining. Okay, and I believe I see the same. So let me do some quick math here. I wanna remind uh, folks that uh, I think uh, Director Binkley is over in the attendees list. And uh, so cannot be, she's on her phone and can't be promoted to the, partic uh, to the panelists. Uh, I don't know if she would like to abstain or not also, but I think she can raise her virtual hand over there. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, so let's lower our hands. And uh, Melinda, what would be the, uh, uh, who, what is the number of those who are present and willing to vote? Uh, we would need 18 members uh, to vote in favor to pass. Okay, thank you. Let me ask that we do this vote by raising your hand virtually. All those in favor of taking a position of supporting Senate Bill 144, please raise your hand and uh, Melinda will count them for us. Wow. Okay, last call. I see uh, Jan Pulowski from Brighton has raised uh, her hand visually. And <laughs> so that would add up, I think, to 20. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Is that correct? Uh, uh, Jan, 
It is correct. And unfortunately, I'm trying to learn this new system. And I wasn't able to, I don't think they heard that I was, I've been present from the beginning and I don't know that that got in. <clears throat> Thank you. All right, uh, Melinda, I would count then 21. Is that uh, your count? That's the same count I have. Excellent, okay, thank you. Uh, just as a matter of formality then, uh, was any director going to be opposed to this? Uh, raise your hand if you intended to be opposed. Okay, thank you very much. So the uh, Dr. Cog board takes a position of supporting uh, Senate bill and I've made it too tiny on my screen again, uh, Senate Bill 144. Uh, thank you, Rich. Uh, go ahead on to the next one. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the next one is uh, Senate Bill 138, uh, introduced as a, as a major uh, greenhouse gas bill. And we're asking for board direction on this. Uh, as it turns out, the bill, the bill was heard in committee in the Senate yesterday and passed um well uh, and uh, but it was significantly amended uh like four pages worth of amendments so, so so i won't go through those what i'll do is um i think ask ron papsdorf to come on and talk about some of the issues and concerns that uh dr cog had um from at least the way the bill was introduced Thank you. Ron, are you here? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, I am. Sure, go ahead. Thank you very much. Ron Papstorf, <clears throat> Planning and Operations Director here at Dr. Cog. Um, Rich asked me to speak to this bill a little bit. I'll, I'll first say that um, much of the policy in this bill is uh, pretty well outside the purview of Dr. Cog. Um, uh, Although uh, we'll note that Dr. Cog staff does believe that removing small engine equipment such as leaf blowers and lawnmowers um, off of the system will have a positive impact on air quality and uh, reduce um, air pollutants and uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So that aligns with our overall broader uh, Dr. Cog policies. Uh, but again, sort of regulating uh, those sort of small engines is, is pretty far outside of, of Dr. Cog's purview. Uh, but there is one component of the bill that um, does raise some questions for us, and, and that is um, uh, provisions in the bill that would um, add additional uh, target years for greenhouse gas emissions. So by way of reminder, back in the 2019 session, House Bill 191261 set statewide greenhouse gas emission targets those targets were set uh, from a uh, reductions from a baseline of 2005 and set targets for 2025, 2030, and 2050. Um, this, um, as a result of Senate Bill 260 uh, last year, then uh, CDOT and the state embarked on rulemaking, as you're well aware, uh, for uh, greenhouse gas trans transportation planning, greenhouse gas. Uh, reduction rule that we were we are now uh, deep in the midst of um, working towards complying with. Um, this bill adds two additional target years uh, to state statute for greenhouse gas reductions, uh, 2028 um, and 2040. And I'd, I'd say I, I don't think staff has particular concerns with sort of, you know, um, with, with those. They're in line with sort of a straight line from the 2025 to 2050 um, targets. The challenge that we foresee is that um, we don't know how that might impact the state's greenhouse gas roadmap um, and the recent and the just adopted in December greenhouse gas transportation planning rule that we're we're now in the middle of, of working to comply with and having sort of additional uh, target years, particularly 2028 which is an odd target year. And if we have to do additional modeling and analysis uh, for a target year between sort of a five-year increment between 2025 and 2030, uh, that's a pretty significant undue sort of um, uh, uh, work issue for us without we see any, any additional benefit in terms of uh, tracking how we're doing on greenhouse gas emissions. Not much is gonna change between 2028 and 2030. Um, and so uh, I think what, what the discussion we'd like to have with the board is uh, potentially uh, seeking amendments to remove uh, that provision with the additional target years 
um, uh, for the greenhouse gas emission reductions and stay pat with uh, the current target years and the greenhouse gas rule and the greenhouse gas roadmap. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, uh, we have a couple of questions in line. Uh, Director Peck, go ahead. My, uh, I'm more of a comment than I am a question. Sure. Um, my problem with this bill is that I feel that it targets uh, the lower income or the, I would say the uh, kind of diverse, I don't, I don't even know how to say this. In, in Longmont, where I live, when I, when I look at who is performing the uh, irrigation, the lawn maintenance, et cetera, it is companies and it is uh, immigrant communities, to be quite honest, who are doing this work. And they have invested a lot of money into their, their equipment. So if this is going to be a huge transition for them economically, and um, unless there is some buyback provision for the equipment that they have already invested in, which is gas uh, blowers, gas, uh, gas lawnmowers, et cetera, it's going to be a huge deficit for them economically to transition to all um, battery powered equipment. And, and I feel that it is, uh, a, a, almost attacking that type of community, not attacking, that's the wrong word, but it's an unintended consequence of what it is going to do to our workers in the immigrant community, in the diverse, in the equity community. It's not equitable. It's not an equitable type of uh, a bill. And since it doesn't lower the GHG by that much, I, I don't feel that I could actually support this. Um, these are service communities that we all need, we all use, and they're not big commercial uh, ear, uh, lawn maintenance, tree maintenance communities, or I'm sorry, businesses. Um, and I don't want to put anybody out of business because they cannot comply. Um, so I, I I just look at this a little bit differently than just reducing greenhouse gases. Who are we actually targeting when we do this? Um, and unless we can come up with a huge difference that it's gonna make in our greenhouse gas uh, compliance, um, I, I just can't see that we should support this bill at all, unless there is something to amend it that we would buy back their, uh, that we would buy back their operational equipment that they're using now or give them some leeway in, in order to comply with this bill. So uh, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> I'm just concerned about our service community that we all use, unless it's a big commercial uh, entity, it's really going to affect our uh, service community for uh, maintenance on our outside maintenance programs or whatever. So um, that, that is my real concern in our community. Thank you, Director Peck. Uh, Rich, have your hand raised. Did you want to respond to that? Yes, real quick. And if I get this wrong, I think Ed can, uh, Ed Bowditch can clarify for me. Uh, as we understand it, the, um, the like the phase out of uh, the small, the, the engines, engines were eliminated. There were, I think there was like a hard stop at 2030 and that was eliminated. Although I think there can still under the bill can still be some rulemaking um, by the AQCC. Um, so it's, I guess maybe been watered down. Thank you, Ed or Jennifer, or do you have any, anything yes, to thank, add to that? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, the hard stop the, the, the prohibition on selling those small lawn and garden things has been removed from the bill. The bill do, still does have a tax credit for replacing those items. So we've gone from the, the stick to the carrot, you might say. There still could be rulemaking on some of those types of motors, but that would be a, a larger um, rulemaking package. Thank you. 
Uh, Rich, was that one of the amendments that you had mentioned in your presentation? You said there yes. were several. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Can Good. I can I make one comment on that? Yes, go ahead, Director. Pack. Is is this for riding lawnmowers as well, or is that considered a larger piece of equipment? I would guess that would fall within the definition. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Director Mulvey. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Question and a couple comments. Um, I'll be real quick. The question is, what's the timing of this? Because it seems as though it might affect quite a few people, um, individual residents who might be doing their own work. Um, some might not have as much economic opportunity to comply um, or small businesses that might have as much time to comply as Director Peck mentioned. And we'd like to be able to bring it to our communities. I'd also like to be able to look at a fiscal note on whether or not the insurance companies would see an increase in the amount of uh, premiums that might result in having to do the additional reporting. So is there enough timing that would allow us to bring this back to our municipalities so that we could get feedback and have a vote of our councils and then re-vote again, perhaps next month at Dr. Cog? <clears throat> a big question, but it's really just a timing question. Okay. Rich, do you have an answer for that? Or Ron? If, if I understand the question, it's, it's, it's always uh, a guess as to how quickly uh, a bill will move. Um, and there may be some additional uh, amendments from others that are being discussed that could slow it down. So it's certainly possible that the bill will still be in the process a month from now when we meet. Uh, my, my comment, thank you for that. My comment, um, it goes a little bit along the lines of what Director Peck mentioned, and that has to do with, in addition to what I mentioned that are concerns, I also join in direct, um, Mr. Papter's comments about the targets being changed. That was something I highlighted, but also if we're going to want to reduce um, gas powered engine emissions, why aren't we looking at everything and things that can also affect safety? I happen to have the bane of my existence is these mini bikes, gas powered golf carts and ATVs that are unsafely driven by teenagers and reckless adults on streets and they're not street rated. So make them impossible because they're gas powered and you're killing two birds with one stone for me. Um, they're still gas powered. If you're going to get rid of gas powered engines, they would probably meet this definition. Why aren't we, why aren't we prohibiting things that are more expensive? You know, for, you know, it's like saying, you know, Apple doesn't have to pay taxes as much, but somebody else, you know, has to pay taxes. Let's, let's make it across the board. That's my two cents and that's what I'm going with. Thank you, Director. Uh, Director Levy, you are up, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I'm, I'm just gonna speak to the uh, additional years to benchmark greenhouse gas reductions because as I understood uh, Rich's recommendation, it was that we really not address the bill on, on the merits since it outside our scope um, and and my question this is a question maybe for Ron Papstor I understand how adding an additional benchmarking year of 2028 is problematic um, I mean we've got 2025 and 2030 and that's only five years apart but it did strike me as perhaps helpful to have that 2040 uh, reporting year, uh, since we are just looking at a straight line extrapolation, because otherwise we've got a 20 year period in which you know, we, we won't know if we're on track or not. And so I, I guess I would like your thoughts on whether having, having that 2040 uh, reporting or, or goal year, what is it, a goal or a target? <laughs> you know, whether that would be helpful just to just to know how well we're doing. Sure, um, hey, thank go you. Ahead, if I may, Mr. Chair, uh, thank yes. you, Director Levy. Um, I, I think it's, um, 
I, and I appreciate um, Director Levy focusing in on sort of the issue that I think as staff we think is sort of within the within the lanes of, of Dr. Cog. Um, I definitely appreciate it, uh, your comments about 2028. That that is probably most most particularly troublesome and, and ch challenging um, in terms of trying to trying to figure out the implications. Um, boy, I should I should know this off the top of my head, and I might I might punt to Rebecca White. Um, if she's still in the meeting, but I believe the greenhouse gas transportation planning rule had included a 2040 greenhouse gas reduction target. Um, and so from that perspective, I, I, I might I might agree um, uh, in terms of sort of our greenhouse gas um, work in transportation planning if, if that's already in the rule. If it's if it's not in the greenhouse gas transportation planning rule, might suggest that that thank you, Rebecca is telling me that that is a correct recollection. Um, so from that perspective, probably the 2040 is is less of a concern of ours, but 2028 is a is a pretty significant concern. Okay, th thanks. I'll, I'll just just briefly to follow up. Um, I then I, I, I you know I think we ought to um ask staff to seek an amendment to delete that 2028 um, but keep the 2040 in even though it's already in the rule because there are lots of other um uh targets and in industries that also would be affected by this and i don't know whether there are independent rules that would require them to um to uh meet a target of 2040. thank you director uh, next up, uh, Director Kerber, please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, you know, I'd like to support uh, Director uh, Peck's uh, comments. As, as I look at it as, as a representative in Greenwood Village, we look at what is good, best for our people, uh, what is best for people to live their lives and, and to do whatever. The 2028 amendment, uh, all it is going to do is, is take money uh, that is going to be expended from to do studies and reports and everything on a goal. Uh, I don't think we've ever met any of our goals. And to have another goal and to have another time, it's going to take money that we could take and use for public transportation or health care or education or something else. It seems like structurally we're always requiring people to make reports uh, that takes economic resources out of our system. Uh, it don't matter, you know, either we're going to make it at 2030 or not, either we're going to make it at 2040 or not. And, uh, and, and we all know that, uh, that while we want to support uh, sustainable uh, societies and reducing greenhouse gases, what we do in Colorado is not going to matter on, on, the, on the, the temperature of the earth. It's not, it's a planetary problem. And uh, for us to do this kind of thing. And it's just how much do you want to hurt the people uh, taking resources from them, uh, from things that are important now to things that, that are or might not matter later. And so I would uh, uh, recommend that, that we oppose the 2028 and the 2040. I take that back. I, I don't care what happens in 2040. There'll be people coming after us that are gonna decide that later on. Uh, definitely 2028 uh, expenditure of resources to do those reports, I think is a, is a tremendous waste of money that, that our people need right now to, to help themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, Director Stolzman, go ahead. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I just, I would like to offer a slightly different perspective, I think, than has been spoken to. So there are so many things in this bill that it makes it very hard to stay focused. So the point of the bill is to work on a, a broad base of things to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in Colorado, which I think largely we all are supportive of having better air quality and reducing emissions. So that's a great start. Um, the, um, on the small engines, I just wanna to touch base on that for a second. I believe the purpose was not to require people to come in and replace their tools. It wasn't about banning people's tools that they own. It was about the sale of new tools. So at some point in time, converting over to new non-combustion technology. Um, so when people replace their tools, they replace them with contemporary standards rather than old technology. So like, for example, the city of Louisville, 
we've been studying our mower replacement schedules and trying to understand how we can convert over. And there are really wonderful hybrid mowers on the market, industrial hybrid mowers. There are really quality electric mowers. Some of the battery life is still short on the electric mowers if you have, you know, if you're mowing all day. Um, but there are really improved alternatives that have much lower emissions than traditional mowers have that really don't have the types of um, catalytic, catalytic converters and other things to reduce emissions. So I think, I think actually the intention around um, the mowers and the small engines isn't what was what I heard described by other members. Um, and in our town, we're looking at autonomous mowers as well. I would encourage you all to look at what's out there um, today because there are some really impressive mowing technologies. Um, there's another topic in this bill around um, insurance and preparing a report for the insurance commissioner. I think everyone on the call knows um, that my community was devastated by the Marshall Fire. Uh, in the end of December, and I think that this is an incredibly important piece of the bill um, to have that insurance report prepared and filed with the Division of Insurance. Um, I have learned a lot about climate risk um, from the unfortunate climate disaster that has struck my community, and my understanding is that the insurance companies already have these types of reports prepared to expose a lot of areas on the front range and increased risk. Um, and even some communities that are becoming uninsurable. And I think we need to all be aware of this information and understand you know, what we need to do to adapt and mitigate these risks. Um, and you know, just like with the floods of 2013 that I unfortunately had to live through as well, um, there are some places we didn't end up rebuilding after the floods because there was just too much risk. And I think we need to have um, this annual report filed with the insurance commission so we can start understanding this data and adapting to the unfortunate situation that we've created as humans. Um, and then just last on the issue that I think is really the issue that Dr. Cog should be discussing tonight is around the additional reporting years. Um, I really appreciate Ron's perspective and I hope you don't let him respond to my comments because he always makes really good points. Um, but I would like to just sort of say I think a difference of opinion on the 2028 year um, because I think Every single piece of information I have seen so far on the greenhouse gas rule that we've set and what we've done indicates that we are not on track to reach our 2030 target. And so I would prefer for us to recognize that failure two years sooner so that we could change course. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Director Sulzman. Uh, next up, uh, Director Hazeman, go ahead. Send those to the EPA to so I heard, uh, Director Peck asked a question earlier about the impact on small businesses, but I don't have an, I haven't heard an answer about whether or not this would impact them. Uh, is there an answer yet on that specific question? Rich or Ron, who wants to take that? Ron, go ahead. Rich or, Rich or I or, or, uh, or Ed. I think we can add, I think, I think the way the bill has been amended coming out of Senate committee there, there is no man. There's no longer there. There never was a mandate for anyone to buy a, a non-gas-powered uh, small engine. Uh, the original bill had a requirement to stop the sale of gas-powered small engines in the state after after a certain date. Um, but there was no. So you wouldn't be able to buy one after that if you were buying a new one. But there was no mandate for anyone to replace an existing gas-powered uh, small engine. Uh, 10 horsepower or less. That provision has now, that per entire provision has now been taken out of the bill um, by, the, by the Senate committee. And now there is simply a tax credit available so that if someone does replace an existing gas powered small engine with um, a, an alternative fuel uh, small uh, equipment like that, they could get a tax credit covering, I think it's 30% of the, of the cost. Um, of the new equipment, so there is there is no mandate. There's 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 no requirement for anyone to do anything. There's a tax credit if someone does replace a gas powered uh, small engine uh, equipment. Ron, does that mean there's no impact on small businesses that do lawn work? Uh, director, I I mean I'm, I I I can't say definitively. Again, not an area I've looked at a, a lot because it's not really a direct purview of Dr. Cog. But I would I would say that um, I don't believe that because there's no mandate here 
uh, for anyone to do anything. It's not forcing anyone to do anything in that in that area. Um, that I, I can't see how there would be a small business impact. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Yeah. Thank you, Ron. I guess the only small business impact would be if that were to be in the bill, which it isn't now, would have been if they replaced that equipment after 2030 and were not able to purchase a replacement that is gas powered, uh, would be would have been the only impact. But now it's, as you said, a carrot uh, rather than a stick. So that's nice to know. Uh, for something that is not within our purview, we're spending an awful lot of, a lot of time talking about it because it's embedded or it was embedded in the bill. Uh, thank you. Uh, Director Combs, go ahead. Um, thank you. So I first would just like to kind of highlight or bold underline whatever the comments made by uh, Director Stolzman um, with respect to wanting to know sooner rather than later if we're not on track with our targets. Um, we can change course and we can do something when we have two years left. And so abdicating that responsibility and that possibility, I think is, um, you know, is irresponsible of us as an entity that's charged with um, addressing greenhouse gas reduction. Um, and then with respect to the insurance issue, um, I had not considered the impacts um, that were mentioned by Director Soldsman. And in Aurora, as in many of our communities, I think we have a lot of areas, a lot of neighborhoods that are constructed similarly and are in similar conditions to those that were destroyed by the fire. So I think it's incredibly important that we provide the necessary support to our communities for ensuring that they are protected against these types of risks. And um, this is a great opportunity to do that. Thank you, Director Coombs. Uh, Director Spear, you're up, go ahead. Thank you. I just wanted to um, echo uh, the comments of Director Stolzman and um, Coombs and just mentioned um, our, our city is uh, taking a position of support on this legislation. Um, and with regard to the uh, increased reporting, I can absolutely empathize <laughs> with the extra time that takes from staff. Um, and, you know, I just really agree that in an emergency situation, as we are currently in with our climate crisis, um, it, it does matter. And I'm just thinking about the, um, even the COVID crisis and, you know, how valuable it was to have regular updates on um, numbers and where cases were peaking on hospitalizations and those sorts of things, because there is still time to make some course corrections. Um, and, you know, I think about every crisis that I've ever uh, managed in my <laughs> work or personal life, it's important to have um, <laughs> as much information about uh, how, whether or not things are on track as possible. Um, and I, you know, I think the other thing uh, that I would say um, with regard to the, um, I know the small engines are not uh, completely within our purview. Um, I think it still does relate to uh, greenhouse gas reductions. And I actually uh, initially went into this thinking similarly to um, Director Peck, um, and was corrected by a number of my constituents who talked about how uh, oftentimes it's the folks who um, are doing the service work who are inhaling all the pollutants from that equipment, um, who are also having to deal with the loud noise that it creates um, and just some of the health effects that, uh, that, that can be um, provided there. So I, I appreciate the, um, and I think our city does as well, the credits that are available um, in this bill for helping people transition to the quieter and um, not uh, in your face emitting um, uh, electric equipment. Thank you. Thank you, Director Spoon. Thank you for uh, refocusing uh, for purposes of the discussion. The small engine uh, issue is no longer in the bill, uh, and we're and we're here discussing it, uh, which is fine. Uh, but remember, it's not in the bill anymore. And in fact, there's a tax credit for anyone who wants to purchase an electric or alternative uh, piece of equipment to replace that. And so, just to keep us focused here, uh, Director Harrison. Thank you very much. Um, in to the 30% uh, income tax credit, do we understand how that number was arrived at in terms of 30%? I do not. Do we have any, op did, was there any other options that we are aware of that were discussed 
along with that in regard to how we incentivize folks to go and buy electric um, equipment? Not that I'm aware of. I wasn't involved in, in any of the negotiations with the sponsor over the amendments. Yeah. Is that the concern? And I think from an income tax credit perspective, as noble as it is, uh, for those, again, who have to go and buy that equipment, uh, say they have gas equipment that dies and they need to go and get something that's electric, um, and they may not have the money at that moment in time to go and have to wait, say, a whole year to get an income tax credit. It seems, seems rather punishing to them as well. If there is any way, that's why I was looking at what options to instantly try to get more funding into their hands sooner in regard to making them whole when they have to go change their equipment. And then the other thing is the assessment of, this is all based on the understanding that battery batteries will improve in terms of how long they can be used and the power that they have uh, between now and that particular time frame, And I don't know, was there any assessment made in regard to that aspect of it? Because obviously for equipment like that, whether it's a large or a larger lawnmower and there are workers that are working on a half acre of land and if their battery dies you know then they then they have to have backups to, for that um and, you know that's something that i don't know whether or not there's any assessment properly made on that um so that that incentive will make sense for folks but, well what i do know is that um you know, the bill as a tax credit then becomes, you know, I guess essentially voluntary that if you replace your equipment, you can claim the tax credit for it. Um, and the only other, uh, I guess, comment, which I'm not sure totally addresses your, your latter point, is that uh, the legislature now has a policy with every tax credit that they um, propose or, or uh, adopt um, that there, there's like a review and analysis process over a period of the next few years to analyze the use of that tax credit and the effect of it. Uh, and then it's the, that information is brought back, brought back to the legislature for consideration as to whether or not the tax credit should continue. Is that, is that a new process in place starting now? That been in place for a while. I think it's been in place for for a couple of years or a few years now. I don't remember exactly when it was first put in place. So the, so the assumption is maybe they're using that data, hopefully, to arrive at what they're talking about for a thirty percent makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then in reference to twenty twenty eight um, date, um, can you provide a little bit more clarity in regard to in real time or year over year, do we have a good idea of where we are in, in terms of our direction and, and where we are in meeting those goals? Maybe not that's legislatively mandated, but do we have data that says, hey, this is where we are in 2022, at the end of 2022, this is where we are at the end of 2023, et cetera? Do we have data available for that? Mr. Chair, uh, Director, yes, um, we, we do not yet. Uh, like I said, the, the state rule was just adopted by the Transportation Commission in December last year. There's been a lot of work going on uh, prior to that and since then to figure out the details of how to actually, as one of the affected MPOs, to actually uh, demonstrate compliance with the rule and go through the analysis. It is, it's quite complicated. Um, and so we're, we're doing that now. Uh, we do have a mandated deadline um, under state law and the rule to complete that work and uh, review our current regional transportation plan by October 1st this year. So by this, by late summer this fall, we will know where we're where we're at in relation to the to the to the greenhouse gas reduction targets uh, included in the rule. Um, and um, at the risk of of debating uh, my friend Director Stoltzman. Um, I think that's part of the reason that we're concerned about adding uh, uh, the 28 target um, in, within that five year. We will know this year where we are in relation to the 20, uh, all of the target years that are in the rule, 
25, 30, 40, and 50. Uh, I, 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 would, I, I just am struggling to see the value of having to add a whole other analysis year. And it's not just a matter of analyzing the year uh, for our transportation. It is a significant amount of work to determine which projects will be completed in, in an additional um, analysis year so that we can actually model the network accurately. Uh, it, it, it's a significant amount of work and we're, we're already asking our staff to do a significant amount of work to go through this uh, modeling process for the horizon years that we already have. And so, and, and 2020 is not aligned with any of our normal horizon years. So for those reasons, we, we really believe that uh, it would, it, it, it's not helpful to, to add an additional year. We don't believe that it adds any additional useful information since we will have completed the analysis for the bracket horizon years of 25 and 30. And we will know whether we're on track or not. All right, thanks for that additional clarity. No more questions. Thank you. Uh, and just uh, for purposes as the discussion moves on, from Denver's standpoint, uh, the council and the administration have not had an opportunity to discuss this bill. And so uh, I, I don't wanna speak for Director Williams, but typically we would abstain on a motion to support and so I would just like to throw on the floor that, that, I, that uh, Denver might uh, vote in favorably on a motion to monitor only at this point. I just wanted to throw that out as the discussion continues, but we would not vote uh, to support uh, something that we have not had a chance to analyze. Uh, Director Vidim, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, presently the two uh, largest sources of air pollution on earth are China and India. The uh, progress that they make uh, to resolve that problem is, on an annual basis is virtually microscopic. So because of the phenomenon of uh, global atmospheric circulation, it's a certainty that some of the pollution that's created in those countries will ultimately wind up in the United States and even in the state of Colorado. Therefore, no matter how uh, benevolent, how uh, well-planned, efforts are to uh, reduce air pollution in the state of Colorado. Making uh, objectives for a 2040 or 2050 may be more dependent upon the efforts of people outside of the state of Colorado and therefore may be unachievable. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Uh, Director Shaw, go ahead. Yes. Um, I think we can all, or most of us could probably see why um, 2028 without additional funding or staffing would be a, a burden on Dr. Cog. Um, and so if there is a you know, possibility of mentioning that, even if we agree to monitor, um, you know, giving guidance, Rich, that, that seems to me to be a, um, a reasonable way to go. Um, I, I would also say, and I think Director Peck had said something in the chat that made a good deal of sense to me. I think Excel Energy has done an excellent job of um, helping to make uh, purchases of LED bulbs affordable on the spot. Um, so rather than this 30% tax credit, if, if uh, there could be a, an immediate credit that's seen at Lowe's or Home Depot, so that instead of 150 bucks for a, a, a blower, you pay 99 and it's only 20 bucks more than it would be for a gas blower, that might actually accomplish more. And again, we're not here to change that, but if Rich has a chance to, to throw the idea out, that certainly might be valuable. Um, with that said, I, I would propose that we monitor, I, I would move that we monitor this. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Before we move on to the next uh, director to discuss. Would anyone like to second that so that we have something on the floor? Uh, let me uh, let me call on Director Ward and I apologize. Uh, I think that you had your hand up earlier and then it disappeared and 
I saw you then in the attendees and now you've moved over again. So uh, uh, let me ask uh, Director Ward uh, for your questions. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, I apologize for that. I had closed out of the meeting and re-signed in and have a whole fiasco going, but I'm back. Um, I just wanted to say uh, two things. One, I am not sure where on our legislative update the city and county of Broomfield is with regard to this Senate bill. So I can't speak to how Broomfield will support it. Um, but the second thing I wanted to mention uh, was I do want to echo everything that Director Stolzman said. Um, and I'll just leave it at that since we've kind of beat this to death. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Director Mulvey. I'll second the motion. Thank you. Uh, Director Teal. Sorry, intended to second as well there, Mr. Chair. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, Director Peck, you had your hand up. Was that to second or did you have comments? It was to second, thank you. <laughs> oh, excellent, okay, thank you. Uh, are there any further comments on this? I don't see any. Thank you, thank you for the discussion. And uh, let me ask uh, first, uh, again, it takes, I suppose it takes two thirds of those present and voting even to monitor, so let me ask, would anyone like to abstain, so we can count them first, from the motion to monitor this bill? Uh, raise your digital hand. Or uh, if you can't uh, find your digital hand, uh, turn your video on and wave at me. Thank you. I see only one, uh, Director Kraftharp. Standing out in the crowd, Director. <laughs> so we have only one, and Melinda, that means it would take two thirds of the total number minus the one who are here right now to approve monitoring. How many would that be? Uh, we would need, sorry. <laughs> I had to do quicker math than I thought I could do. Um, okay. Uh, so we would need 23 in favor. In order to monitor, okay. Correct. Thank you. Uh, so then let me ask for the vote, for all those in favor, of monitoring uh, this bill, uh, the number of which is still too small on my screen, uh, but we all know what it is. Raise your digital hand. Digital. All those in favor, raise your digital hand. One, two, three, four, I see 22. I see 22. And you say we needed 23, ah, there we go. Thank you, Director Cockrell. <laughs> uh, is that it? Did you count 23, uh, Melinda? I'm going back and doing a double check, but I think I counted the same amount as well. Oh, and then we had another one pop up. Okay, thank you. 23, are there any opposed? Uh, everybody put your hands down. Anybody opposed, uh, raise your hand. Opposed to monitoring this, I see. Uh, do, 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 do. Melinda, I see four. Is that what you see? That is what I see as well. Great, so 23 uh, would carry the motion favorably, is that correct? Correct. Okay, so we take a, the board takes a position of monitoring uh, this bill. Thank you, Rich. Is that, uh, that was the second and last one, was it not? That is correct, Mr. Okay. Chair. Thank you very much uh, for, and Ed and Jennifer, thank you for being here as well. Uh, let's move on to our informational briefing, item 11, MetroVision background briefing. It's attachment F, but Andy Taylor, I believe, is going to put it up on our screen as well. And this is a welcome informational briefing for a lot of our new faces as well to become familiar with uh, what MetroVision is. Thank you. Go ahead, Andy. If you can maximize this. Oh, you beat me to it. Uh, go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Um, thank, uh, thank you for the time tonight. Um, I'm Andy Taylor. I get to manage the regional planning team here at Dr. Cog. And I just have a few slides that provide some background uh, on MetroVision that might help uh, provide a framework for some upcoming strategic planning discussions. So Dr. Cog is a regional planning commission under state statute. And as such, we have a duty to adopt a regional plan. 
Dr. Cog has been doing this work for some time. Uh, our first regional plan predates any of our transportation planning work as a metropolitan planning organization or the beginning of our area agency on aging. The plan doesn't have the same force or effect as your comprehensive plan locally. It's about creating a shared vision that multiple jurisdictions can subscribe or aspire to. Uh, since 1997, Dr. Cog's regional plan has been known as MetroVision. It continues to focus on how this region grows, the transportation system we use to get around it, and the resulting built and natural environment. Uh, the most recent version of MetroVision was adopted unanimously by this board in 2017. One of the biggest changes in this version was how it was organized. Around this time, Dr. Cog was scrutinizing its structure, work, and governance using a balanced scorecard approach. So it made sense to align MetroVision with the same structure. Uh, much to the chagrin of many of my planning colleagues, you won't find any goals or strategies or policies in this structure. But the whole structure is oriented to help us focus on the highest strategic altitude, where we have the most consensus and agreement before moving down levels on the diagram. Uh, with this vision for the first time, or with this version for the first time, MetroVision does not contain its own unique vision statement. Instead, the plan aligns with the board adopted mission and vision for Dr. Cog. Hopefully, uh, this is this is somewhat familiar as it's often on the screen or when we're back in person, uh, often at your table during our meetings. Um, this is the vision that Dr. Cog is working towards, uh, as well as the strategic work identified in MetroVision. Uh, MetroVision's five overarching themes begin to provide some structure and further uh, the description of the region's future based on that vision. Uh, these five themes organize 14 interrelated aspirational outcome statements. And so these themes serve as sections or elements of the MetroVision plan document. The language of these themes, as well as the outcome statements, is future-oriented. They don't describe what we're doing as a region, but provide a window to our aspirational future. Uh, each of these outcomes has a set of objectives. Uh, these describe the continuous improvements needed to achieve plan outcomes. I find myself revisiting this level of the plan quite a bit, as it really helps connect that future vision uh, to the projects and programs today. It helps me explain why we could or should make certain priorities. Uh, outcomes and objectives also have a descriptive narrative to explain a bit more uh, about our intent. And it's these statements and their narratives that the board spent quite a bit of time finding consensus and even uh, doing some wordsmithing altogether. Uh, the strategic initiatives are really where the work happens. They describe how the plan can get implemented, but implementation success depends on many partners and local governments, and we recognize that each will contribute through different pathways and at different speeds for some collective impact. Uh, we measure that impact through a series of performance measures that are relevant to the different plan areas and can be reported on using regularly updated and reliable data sources and uh, use measure, measurable and quantitative information rather than just anecdotal insights. For each of these measures, the plan currently includes a 2040 target. Now, just to put it a little bit in context, we've often described uh, MetroVision as umbrella over some of our other uh, plans and programs. Uh, here's an example with uh, the key products that Dr. Cog adopts as part of the regional transportation planning process. And so with that, I know I'm, I'm pretty close to the end of the agenda here, so I wanted to keep it quick, but I would encourage you to go to metrovision.drcog.org if you're interested in checking out uh, more about the plan itself and, and uh, uh, getting more familiar with some of the outcomes and objectives. Yeah, thank you very much, Andy. Uh, one thing that was pretty cool on there that I noted was uh, that uh, in 1960, when the regional plan was published, it was we were called the Inter-County Regional Planning Commission, and we were based at a tiny little building at 2442 South Downing, which today is a collection agency. 
So uh, I don't know what that says about us, but uh, uh, folks who know me know that I'm a history buff. And I got it. Uh, Director Levy, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andy, for reminding us of a really important part of what Dr. Cog does. I, I um, actually went back and looked at the statute that authorizes us as a regional planning commission because um, I, I was trying to remember um, how what a regional planning commission does intersects with, you know, what local bodies do. And um, we, we heard a lot of really great comments during the public comment section, section about um, the value of land use planning. And, and there's a provision in um, section 3028-106-2 that, um, that addresses regional planning commissions. And it, it provides for the possibility of a regional plan being submitted to the planning commission of a municipality or a county for adoption. Obviously it can't be binding unless that's been done. And I was just wondering whether uh, Dr. Cog has ever submitted um, our regional plan to a local planning body to, um, to have it incorporated. Yeah, that certification process that's described in statute, it's been there for a long time and I think it predates a lot of the more robust comprehensive planning work that, that um, all of your local governments have been doing, um, especially uh, more so over the last 20 years. Uh, I think this was uh, more a way of passing on what, um, what the regional plan was and giving those local governments an option to adopt this almost to have the same effect uh, as a comprehensive plan. Uh, it's not something to my knowledge that we've ever necessarily done. And I'm trying to figure out a, a little bit when we uh, are considering doing some future amendments, what that process could look like to, to just get the word out to planning commissions um, and, and city and county clerks uh, to, to distribute to those planning commissions, uh, what that would mean um, um, just to get uh, more more eyes on this plan. Well, I, I think it would be interesting to consider doing that, actually, because, um, you know, the next item on um, on uh, our Metro Vision performance measures updates and the areas where we're not meeting those performance measures are, are those where the you know, the bulk of the control is um, in local land use. And I, I just, I think we ought to have a conversation about how to try to get better buy-in from all the member um, entities here to the, to the planning vision that Dr. Cog has created. Because I, I, well, if we're going to spend some time on the next agenda item, I'll hold my comments until then. But, you know, there is a there is a framework and statute for trying to actually have better integration. Um, it sits there on the books and maybe we ought to think about activating it. So that, that's what I wanted to say for now. Thank you, Director Levy. That's very uh, interesting to come in. <clears throat> I think uh, Executive Director Rex, you want to... Uh, a comment on this. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And first of all, uh, Director Levy definitely gets the gold star for research this evening. That's uh, that's impressive to look up statutes related to this. I know once a legislator, always a legislator. Hey, 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 Commissioner Levy. Um, no, but I uh, no, thank I'll you very say much. Once for... a lawyer, always a lawyer. Ah, there you go. Yeah. There you go. Yes. I um, no, I appreciate the comment certainly. Um, you know, I, I asked I asked Annie to provide a little bit of an update today because the, some of the conversation that we are going to have with you all at the retreat is related to a five-year strategic plan and uh, the possibility of the uh, introduction of some new initiatives or programs at Dr. Cog, and we wanted to make sure that there was at least somewhat of a foundation of knowledge of our of, of our board with regards to the Metro Vision Plan because we plan on relating those new initiatives and programs back to elements within the, within the Metro Vision Plan to make that connection. So that is really the purpose for, for the presentation tonight. Um, but I also wanted to mention 
as Director Levy brought it up, the next agenda item is actually an information item, not a briefing this evening. Um, it's there for your information. Now, I and um, a couple things. We are more than happy to provide a presentation at uh, at, at the next meeting um, if that if that's so de so desired. Um, we felt a little uncomfortable in some respects in, pre in presenting the information because. Uh, some of the data, you know, because it's, it's it, there's a lot of COVID data in there, um, and they they're you know some of it is it's it's outlier type stuff, and we just had a difficult time coming to uh, to grips exactly what it means. Um, but we would be happy to provide a, a briefing at the next meeting if, if it's so desired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Certainly, thank you very much, Doug. Um, thank you, Director Levy, for bringing that up. Uh, I'm going to go to my PDF here. Uh, next item we have is our is committee reports, and uh, the first one is from the the stack and uh, Director Maurer. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, at the March eleventh, twenty twenty two, we all of our agenda items were informational, um, and CDOT staff had been working with the Hawk Agency Coordination Committee which includes Dr. Cog, to develop the Greenhouse Gas Mitigation Policy Directive. CDOT's proposal is to bring a mitigation policy directive to the Transportation Commission for adoption in April. So we will be hearing a little bit more about those. Um, and then CDOT presented an update on transit projects for the 20 year plan. And they are recommending to take a statewide slice off the top of the 10% transit set aside funds to pay for transit operating and maintenance for busting type services before allocating the balance of that fund among the regions. And this off the top allocation to the state is about 77 million over five years and representing 46% of the total available for transit over five years. Um, this um, reduces transit resource available to fund transit projects in region one, about 21 million and region four, about 20 million. And, and this is a little shift and we usually don't use project funds for operations and maintenance, but um, see that we, we asked, um, and this is the stack asked for more conversations and clarifications about this. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, Metro Mayor's Caucus, uh, Director Starker, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The, uh, the caucus has not met since our last meeting, so I have no uh, current report and the, we will meet again on April the 6th. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Metro Area County Commissioners, Director Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, last meeting was held on um, March 4th at the Dr. Cog office meeting rooms. And I want to say thank you to Executive Director Doug Rex for his support of that. We had great participation by member counties. Uh, we have uh, decided to focus our attention um, of, of the MAC specifically on unhoused populations, so homelessness. And in fact, we will um, co-host the second annual MDHI convening on homelessness. We did um, make take steps to finalize our selection of the logo. And the next meeting will be on April 15th and um, every following third Friday at that point. Um, that concludes my report. Thank you, Director, and thank you for bringing that up at our safety committee today, Denver City Council had a briefing from uh, uh, Dr. Reif at the Metro Denver Housing Initiative. Uh, thank you for taking that on. Uh, next is Advisory Committee on Aging, uh, uh, Ms. Sanchez Warren, go ahead. Hi, um, yeah, we had a very interesting meeting. We had an update on legislation from Rich that, that you heard about tonight. Um, we also heard from one of our contractors, we fund a really um, kind of uh, innovative fall prevention program. Um, and I'm hoping to get them in front of you. So I won't give you all of the, the details here. I'll just tell you the highlights. Um, 
we have 11,920 people signed up in this fall prevention program. It's virtual. You can access it through your phone. Um, it's been incredibly successive, uh, or successful. Um, in fact, the most successful in the country, um, which is very uh, encouraging. Uh, the data shows that we 46% um, of people who are on it, of those 11,900, almost 12,000 people, said their air balance had improved. 42% said they felt more steady. 70% reduced fear of falling. Fear of falling is a really big problem. Um, the data is compared to national statistics and it, um, it's always hard with preventative programs, right? But um, analyzing the data with, with um, our results, it looks like that we prevented 162 um, uh, hospitalizations, sorry, yeah, hospitalizations, 54 lives were saved from falls and over 1,428, about 1,428 falls reduced, so people didn't fall at all, uh, which is pretty wonderful statistics. You know, falls are the, the top accidental cause of death for people over 65. Um, they're one of the leading causes of, uh, of hospitalizations. They cost the state of Colorado hundreds of thousands of dollars each year. Um, so it is uh, a really, uh, it's also required under the Older Americans Act um, to have evidence-based programs and they emphasize fall prevention. So um, we are very, very happy with this program. And um, I think those board members that are on advisory committee on aging, I think uh, would testify to what a, what a good program and a, what a good presentation it was. That's my report. Wow, thank you very much. Uh, Regional Air Quality Council, Executive Director Rex, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Uh, the, the Regional Air Quality Council met on Friday, March 4th, and uh, the highlights of that meeting was a presentation by staff on the on the SIP elements and the, um, the upcoming SIP elements and a preview on the ozone modeling. Staff does a tremendous job of, of educating us on a very complicated process and it's, uh, it's definitely appreciated, I can tell you that. So that, that was a good presentation and discussion associated with. Um, uh, the other item I might refer from the National Jewish Health on research that he's doing related to who's at risk during high pollution events. Um, that presentation is online uh, on the REC website if anybody's interested. He, he, that anybody knows Dr. Gerber, he does a fantastic job. That's it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Do you want to put a link to that in the chat, uh, Doug, if you have it handy? Mm, uh, before. I'll try to find it real quick. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up is uh, E-470 Authority, Director Mulvey. Hi. Uh, yeah, the main subjects of the meeting were... Um, business oriented items. Some of it was uh, pro forma, some of it was reports. And the most interesting things to this group may have been the uh, road widening project approval, contract approval, the roadway and roadside maintenance contract approval, guardrail maintenance contract approval, and also the approval of a number of IT contracts, including IT security for the uh, toll taking devices. Um, there was also a review of the customer experience survey, all of which was very positive. So they're in uh, excellent financial health, and um, it's all really very, very good looking in my view, because it's really well operated from a fiscal standpoint. That concludes my report. Thank you very much. Uh, next up is CDOT, uh, Director White. Uh, thank you, Chair. Good evening, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to introduce Jessica Mickelbust earlier tonight, and uh, I think I have already uh, taken a good amount of time for the board, so I'll just leave it with that tonight for CDOT. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next up is a report from RGD Fast Tracks, uh, Director Van Meter. Thank Welcome. you, Chair. One item to report relative to fast tracks at RTD. And that is that RTD late last month announced the selection of HDR as a consultant firm 
that will assist us in our Northwest Rail peak service study, um, which we will be embarking on in full force presently. And uh, we anticipate to take about two years for that study. Again, that, um, and I've told uh, the board before about that study, looking at the possibility of peak service, three trips in the morning from Longmont to Denver Union Station along the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Northwest Rail alignment and three return trips in the peak period in the afternoon from Denver Union Station to Longmont. That's why it's named the Peak Service Plan or study. And we're pleased to have selected HDRs, uh, the consulting firm, uh, to work with and, and um, proceed forward on that study. So I uh, look forward to providing additional updates as that moves forward and on other aspects of fast tracks as they move forward. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Bill. And if you hold on, uh, uh, Director Peck wants to, uh, I think, ask a question or make a comment. Go ahead. Once again, I hit my raised hand in error. I so apologize. I have no questions. <clears throat> Well, given the, to given the topic, I thought you, yeah, for sure you had a question here. <laughs> I could make one up for you, probably. But oh, oh do, do. And it would be the right one. <laughs> Go ahead and do that. Uh, uh, that way, well, we've been here long enough, I think. Uh, let, yeah. me, let me move on to informational items. And item 13 is of a specific interest given the discussion and the presentation uh, from uh, Andy Taylor and uh, the comments from uh, uh, Director Levy. And uh, Doug in the executive director Rex in the chat has said that we will schedule a uh, presentation on the Metro Vision performance measure uh, status uh, at the next meeting. Uh, I assume it's the next meeting, Doug, correct? Okay, thank you. And then the other informational, and that's in your packet if you wanna read it ahead of time and, uh, and do some crib work for that, uh, before that next meeting. Item 14, administrative modifications to the 2225 tip. Uh, to read at your leisure. Administrative items, our next meeting is April 20th, which I think is Earth Day. Is that not, is that not Earth Day? That is Earth Day, isn't it? Uh, and uh, other matters by members. Let me ask if other members have matters that they want to bring to us. I see uh, Executive Director Rex. What is your other matter? Thank you, sir, very much. Um, I was remiss in my, in my director's report today to mention that in the email reminder that was sent out to you all about the board retreat, there was a nine question survey that was, that was also there. You would have to have scrolled down a little bit um, in order to find it. Um, we would, would request that all board members fill that out. It's basically, it's, it's, a, it's a survey related to housing and what, uh, uh, what, if any, communities are doing related to this topic. Um, it, it basically will help us set the stage for the conversation that we expect to have at the board retreat in the afternoon. So um, we will be sending out additional reminders as we always do, but, um, but please just be reminded to fill that out. It would really help with our discussion. Thank you. And yeah, thank you, Doug. And, and I was remiss in not reminding you that you forgot to mention that uh, <laughs> be, because that exec committee, you said you're gonna mention it. I, like many people here, perhaps I, when I saw the reminder about the retreat, I read the subject line of the email and I didn't even open it. I just saw that it was a reminder about the retreat. Please open that email and go down to the bottom and there's a link to fill out that housing survey. And given that uh, this is going to be a key focus, uh, not only for us and not only for all of our jurisdictions individually, most likely, uh, but also for metro area county commissioners, uh, please take that survey uh, and fill that out. The only other matter I think I would have is to say that regretfully, if uh, that we're not in person, if we were in person, I would shake uh, Director Vidim's hand and thank him. Uh, but since we are not in person, uh, again, please accept uh, my thanks and the thanks of the entire board and the Dr. Cog staff for your service. Other matters by any other member? Seeing none, uh, the next item is to adjourn. Uh, thank you very much, folks. We'll see you at the retreat. Right. Oh. See you at the retreat. Take care. Oh, the wow. is Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone. Oh,